Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era was unsanitary to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and you may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just, woo, that was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste, human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone, just like that. Now we have poo-pourri. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray and after you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities in staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. Crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five, Gaius Valerius Catullus rap battle. Who doesn't love a good beef? Now, Catullus was a major poet. His works moving away from the retelling of classic tales and focusing more on the telling of day-to-day -day life. The personal nature of his works have lived in the minds of thousands, depicting humor, romance, and the beauty of day-to-day -day life. However, Catullus was no stranger to critics. Two of his biggest 
being another poet, Furious, and Senator Aurelius. Now, constructive critique can be wonderful for artists. After all, it's the only way that you can improve. However, Catullus seemed to take a different view, writing a poem in dedication to his critics. Commonly referred to as Catullus 16, this poem was so filthy that it wasn't fully translated until the 20th century, and even then, several lines were heavily censored in most publications. Wanna hear it? Well, it reads... Number 4. Roman Birth Control Romans were... Well, they got around a lot. Now, unless you want to deal with the immediate consequences of a whole lot of lovin', you gotta figure out a way to stay safe. Picking up condoms from a shopper's wasn't really a thing, and Plan B hadn't been invented yet, so what was the plan? Well, it turned out that the Romans had discovered an herb called silphium, which supposedly had contraceptive properties. Whether or not that's actually true remains to be seen, specifically due to the fact that you can't find it anymore. That's right, the Romans were so raunchy and Silphium was so popular that they caused the complete extinction of the plant, the last stock of it reportedly being given to Emperor Nero. Now in 2020, there has been a theory presented that there is a similar herb, or a relative, found in Turkey, and it could be the surviving relative of the plant. But to this day, not a sprig of Silphium has been found. Apparently, it looks like a heart though. Aw, ecological devastation. Number 3. Roman Baths the terms made its way around. Roman baths are synonymous with the country and culture as a symbol of civilization. But you've listened to enough of this list so far, so you can probably figure out where this is going. See, while Romans were known for their hygiene, urine laundry aside, they were usually pretty nasty when it came to bath time. Soap wasn't really a thing, so the baths were basically just huge vats of oil that they just slather up all in there. Now these oils were perfumed, but they were also reused used frequently and were washed off using a strigil, a sort of scraping tool, so you know, just spoon the dirt off. Ugh. Number 2. Cato the Younger All right. Here's a fun one. Marcus Porcius Cato, also known as Cato the Younger, was a Roman senator in the later years of Rome. A hugely influential man, his life was fraught with turmoil and strife. He was also a strong opposer of Julius Caesar's Hellenistic principles. Uh, Cato had no trouble joining the opposition on the brewing civil war. Now, during that civil war, Cato took command of a campaign in Utica, a tough campaign that he generally just planned to abandon alongside the Roman Empire. However, once they'd been defeated, Caesar moved to pardon Cato's family and allies. Convinced his end was drawing near, Cato took his life against his friends and family's advice, stabbing himself in the abdomen. Now, some accounts claim that he actually drew out his own entrails from his body when the physicians attempted to heal him, ensuring that he wouldn't see Caesar's Rome. Maybe he knew that Caesar was planning to pardon him as well, which Cato would have considered the crueler punishment. Number one. Caligula's horse. Ah, we'd be remiss not to talk about the antics of Emperor Caligula. Famed for his strange ways, one of the greatest legends of an already infamous emperor was his attempt to have his favored horse, Incitatus, enlisted as a consul. According to Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars, this horse was dressed in lush finery, inviting dignitaries to dinners, and according to Cassius Dio, the horse was fed oats mixed with gold flakes and also possibly a priest? Uh, now, a lot of this is left up to debate, and a number of historians will argue that this was nothing more than a prank at the expense of the Senate. While never officially made a consul, this horse has lived on in infamy, inspiring a number of fictional depictions in modern media, including the metal band Caligula's Horse. Regardless of the official status of the horse, the truth seems to be that this was nothing more than an attempt to mock his senators, but what a method of mockery. Number 10. Train Engine Cleaner Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! 
you can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi, where you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God, look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five, a rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No. No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck 
in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number 3. Matchstick Makers The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls. And in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you want to take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming Resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the Night Soil Man? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soilman come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Number five, Abel and Baker. Okay, we often remember Laika the space dog and her 103 minute cosmic journey aboard Sputnik 2. But does anybody remember Abel and Baker? Why don't we talk about these two enough? This was the American version of Laika. This was less than two years right after that. It was May 28th, 1959. The United States launched two female primates. They launched Abel and Baker into space. This mission only lasted 15 minutes and they both safely returned back home. That's wild to me. The monkeys weren't injured from the cosmic commute at all. A radio message came in shortly right after they splashed down in the Atlantic and the message said, no injuries or other difficulties. Thank the Lord, we love that. Abel and Baker, perfect, as they said. I don't think we can blast any more primates into space going 10,000 miles an hour anymore, but it's wild to me that we did this ever. This is insane. A human had to strap in a chimp into a rocket ship and be like, all right, see ya, and then, that's insane. Grown adults had to do that. That's insane. Abel sadly passed away shortly after the flight. Nothing to do with the actual flight itself, just timing. Meanwhile, Baker, she got famous. She was getting 150 fan letters a day. Imagine if she had Twitter. Oh, it'd be wild. These ladies are icons. Never mind Laika, okay? Hit that thumbs up for Abel and then subscribe for Baker. They went in space. That's crazy. Number four, asteroid redirection. Speaking of space, this one has Michael Bay written all over it. I can't wait. I'm pretty excited for this project. I can't even catch a baseball with my hands. You're telling me NASA is gonna catch an asteroid hurling through space? This is the future. We've arrived. NASA landing on an asteroid is one thing. Sure, that's, you know, a Michael Bay movie. But their asteroid redirection mission, that's a whole nother level. This coming Monday, as in like four days from now, I don't know, NASA is gonna broadcast its first attempt to modify the orbit of an asteroid hurling through space. This is real life. And before you start to panic, no, there's no way any debris can hit the Earth after said test. But if an asteroid was coming for Earth, well, now we have a backup plan to hopefully, ideally, save the human race and the planet. That would be helpful. That's always handy. The planetary defense team is using a craft called DART, just sending a, sending a DART out there. You got a dart? Awesome. Double asteroid redirection test, dart, which will ideally target the asteroid Dimorphos and then altering its orbit. And we can tune in live to watch the whole thing on Monday because that's where we're at in the future.
We can just tune in live and watch Jake Paul fight someone or watch an asteroid get blasted off of its course. How are you spending your afternoon this Monday? Number three, mass extinctions. Are we part of the sixth extinction? I mean, we're talking about asteroids getting blasted away from Earth. It kind of feels like it. It kind of feels like something's nearing us. It's happening right now, isn't it? We lose thousands of species every year. And when looking in the past, Sure, asteroids and ice ages, they've all caused these massive extinction level events, of course. But after humans invented the wheel and discovered fire and, you know, became the worst things ever to exist, things started to change naturally. In the 1800s, industrialization drove up extinction rates and continues to do so, obviously. We're not helping the planet by any means. And according to Elizabeth Colbert, across the world, scientists every day are monitoring what could be the largest extinction event since the dinosaurs. Right now, it's happening right now. The way human beings interact with the environment and affect biodiversity, it could be more deadly than an asteroid hitting the Earth. That's a, that's a fun, scary fact, okay. With an ever-climbing list of endangered species, Colbert and the world ask the question, is it too late to change it? Kinda feels like it's too late. Okay, let's move on to something a little more lighter so we don't feel like complete trash, deal? deal. Number two, re-laxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've figured this out by now, but these messy illnesses were putting a lot of pressure on medical practitioners back in the Victorian day, so they were desperate for new treatments. Sometimes I laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried. And they also achieved many medical breakthroughs, one that I saved for number one. But when it came to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, that wasn't our finest hour. No, we didn't figure that one out, I don't think, right off the bat. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, just let that sink in for a second. I have chicken pox. What should I do, doc? Eh, just go take a shit. Or six. I don't know, might help. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Yeah, who would have thought, right? You thought you were uncomfortable before. Well, not even close. Not every answer was a solution in the Victorian era. But this one was. And finally, number one, the discovery of penicillin. Thank God this one happened. This was, we'll still talk about this one because it's a really good one. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody is in the room or no one's looking. That's ideally the best time. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin back in 1928. Now at the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, which is bacteria that causes infections and boils and all that nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a well-earned two-week vacation, he left a Petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus right there on the table, just sitting there. Rather than, you know, stored away in an incubator, he just accidentally left it out. Now during this time off, a penicillium mold, the spore just drifted in there, either through a window or up the lab stairwell, some Horton here's a who type commute. It drifted in there and the temperatures of the room and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed for the mold to fight back. And then miracles literally happened. It then prevented that bacteria from growing anymore. So he returned and discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. So now we have a solution that isn't a laxative. You know what I mean? Now we have some things that help us out medicinally. Yeah, we got asteroids, some medicines, some, some horrible history, some dark, Dark, tragic events, we got it all in this list, really. I don't know how to tell you that. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver-tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm getting a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy 
could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby, yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women, like 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five, scarab worship. Ancient Egyptians worship scarabs aka dung beetles, the ones that roll a poop. Yeah, you know them. When we think of animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we always go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles that Egyptians couldn't keep their hands off. They were also known as scarabs back in the day, but Egyptians would observe these scarabs rolling around these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle disappeared into their hole. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun, which of course leaves at the end of our day, spoiler alert, and the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab scarab as a head. And he was also responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every day. And then, of course, he put it back into his little hole. Number four, sweat perfume. This next one here reminds me of Gwyneth Paltrow's goop. You ever hear of that? Google that after you're done here. What a ride that is. Here we go. Ra, the Egyptian sun god, he was born from a giant body of water when life first began. I mentioned this earlier in our list. You remember the whole, ah, hey kids, giving birth thing? Yeah, him. Well, in ancient Egyptian mythology, many thought perfumes were made out of Ra's sweat, and Egyptians would cover themselves, just lather themselves in that. Perfume back then wasn't like the kind that we see now, obviously. Ancient Egyptians would apply 
apply oil-based perfumes all over their body, which mainly consisted of water lilies from the Nile. Today it's a little different. Today it's like Playboy Malibu or like Axe Body Spray or Lynx if you're in Britain. There you go. What happened, right? Bring back the sweat oils from gods. I would much rather buy that from my local pharmacy. Number three, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path. Just like ancient Rome, there's always going to be a jealous brother. Osiris' brother, Set, was a jealous brother, so he tried to take out Osiris at every turn. One elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked. This was like a saw trap setup. This was nuts. First, Set designed a coffin that matched Osiris' measurements to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin coffin is then his, you know, like a gift, like a gift coffin. I always wanted one of those for the holidays. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge, he jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, Set locked him inside through the coffin in the Nile River. Yeah, and in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. So if any of your coworkers want to show you a coffin in the break room, you should respectfully decline that offer. Number two, heart eater. Like I mentioned earlier with the goddess of plagues, ancient Egyptians saw their gods as helpful healers, but at the same time, you know, balance, they would be quite dangerous. Khonsu, for example, the god of the moon, is famously known as the god of healing. Now, if you watched Moon Knight on Disney+, Plus, this should ring a bell. Khonsu also had a reputation for eating human hearts. I mean, ironically, it's the perfect scenario. It's quite balanced, right? Amit would be happy with this one. He heals, but he also eats hearts. So it's like, which H are we gonna get, right? The healing heart or the hungry heart? And finally, number one, pet party. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below. I wanna see what animals are running about. Which animals fill your house? We were always a dog family growing up. My aunt has three pugs. It's really the dream come true. I want three wiener dogs. That's really my goal in life. But ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two and they were a little different. Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians. Egyptians were of course fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. But did you know that they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and even baboons? I thought dogs doing their business inside of the home was was annoying. But a lion? Imagine waking up to that and be like, ugh, where do I even start? Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they had died, just like how today many owners cremate their pets. The little paw print on the tiny vase, it's always so sad. You're like, oh, who's this? Ugh. I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but you know, hey, whatever floats your boat, go for it. Other creatures were also specifically trained to work as helper animals. Ancient Egyptian police officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling. Imagine that. Imagine you steal bread for your family and you look back and a baboon is chasing you down? Number 10. Roman Laundry Detergent. So my washing machine broke this past week, which was a pain in the neck. Worst thing about it was that it broke in the middle of a load, so I had to wash the rest by hand, which made me glad we have washing machines at all. However, the Romans were a little more simplistic with their methods of cleansing the cloth. Apparently, vessels were set out in the streets of Rome for anyone to just walk up to and relieve themselves into, and once full, they'd be taken down to the local laundromat. From there, workers would mix the vats with water and pour the combo onto their patrons' clothes, proceeding to stamp the clothes until clean. Yeah, sure, clean. Number 9. The Fall of Drusus In the case of historical poisonings, it's hard to determine whether or not they were actually poisoned or just died from being old. It's usually that they're old. But in the case of Drusus, the evidence was a little bit more clear. See, Drusus Julius Caesar was set to be the heir to Tiberius due to familial relations. His buddy Sejanus would have normally been the one to get the title, but blood is thicker than water. As a result, Sejanus tried to marry his daughter to Drusus' son, but that fell through. Sejanus was still determined to become the heir to Tiberius by whatever means necessary. This led to the two infighting frequently, and Sejanus eventually managed to seduce Drusus' wife, Lavilla, who aided him in poisoning her husband, slowly killing him in a way that appeared to be natural. And he got away with it. Sejanus continued to rise to power until his 
sudden and brutal execution, which was later revealed to be due to someone leaking the truth about his rise to Tiberius. Man, this just needs to be a telenovela. Number 8. Decimation You've likely heard the term before used to describe the impact of some tragedy or another. However, the word actually has its roots in the Roman military, though its origin is a little different from how you might imagine. See, as I'm sure you know, the Roman military was infamous for its discipline and strategy. But if you've ever worked in any space with more than 10 people, you know it's hard to keep everyone in line. So how did the Romans do it? Simple. If one squad member screws up, the entire unit gets the punishment. Decimation roughly translates to removal of a tenth. The cohort would be divvied up into 10 groups, and each group would draw lots. The group with the shortest straws were then executed by the other nine by whatever method was determined by their commander. The nine of the surviving groups were then made to survive off barley, and if they had to relieve themselves, it would be outside of the camp's security. You know what? Maybe the military life just ain't for me. Number 7. The Crassus Cocktail ah, I love a good drink at the end of the day. Just getting a little mix here and there, it's just so fun. Ooh, it's good? Man. Just caps off a hard day of work. It seems like Crassus was a man of similar taste. A general and a statesman who'd earned the title the richest man in Rome. Dude ran a bunch of wars, serious campaigns, and his last was against the Parthians. Primarily because he was just kind of bent out of shape that the other generals were outshining him in the field. Unfortunately, Crassus's forces were absolutely slaughtered, and when his son Publius ended up being one of the casualties of war, Crassus went to parley. Negotiations went sour, and he and his entire party were wiped out. Apparently, after such a rough day, the Parthians figured that Crassus could use a little something to take the edge off, so they had him take a sip of molten gold. Fun fact, the uh, melting point of gold is about 1064 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that'll have a kick. Number 6. The Fall of Emperor Valerian One of the later emperors of Rome, Valerian rose to power simply and ruled simply. Went to war a few times, killed a bunch of Christians, got beat up by Goths, basic Roman stuff. So when Valerian was captured by Cameo of Shapur I, it boggles the mind why they went as far as they did in making sure that this dude wasn't just defeated, they made sure his entire genetic code wouldn't survive the humiliation he received. First on the menu was for the Shapur to use him as a footstool while mounting their horses. He was then given the Crassus Special, a big old bowl of molten gold right down the gullet, which may or may not have happened while he was simultaneously being alive. His skin was then allegedly stuffed with straw and died, hung in the Persian temple for all to see. Seriously, the dude just didn't like Christians. Chill. Number 5. Jolly Lad When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly. Just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so uh... Number 4. The First Counterculture The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. 
Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial unaliver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some b-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias, some say it was Prince Albert, there's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack, that actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then, kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there ladies, just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old Blight herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic, that's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Blight. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror. The absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, an apple a day. If you threw an apple at somebody today, that would be assault. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. You can't huck food at people now, then, ever. Let's just not do that anymore. But in ancient Greek days, it was a little different, dare I say. The apple, back then, had quite the symbolism attached to it. The apple was sacred to Aphrodite. This was a symbol for the goddess of love. So, to throw an apple at somebody, that meant you were throwing your heart at them, right? How romantic is that? Just a nice apple with bugs in it, you're like, here you go, there's lunch. Ancient flirting, my friend. The more you know. Maybe those trees in the Wizard of Oz weren't mean. Maybe they weren't mean at all. Maybe they were just trying to express their love by throwing apples aggressively at everyone involved. Number nine, raining iguanas. Okay, we're immediately dipping back into the weird side of this list. Here we go. Back in 2018, this was wild. I read about this and I'll never forget. Lives rent free right in my head. Florida got another odd headline. There you go, classic Florida. This time it was frozen iguanas falling from the skies. Yeah, how do you not pick up that paper, right? Florida got hit with a a massive snowfall, their first big one in 28 years. So these cold-blooded guys started to fall from suburban tree branches, right? They didn't see it coming at all. People were just walking to get groceries and iguanas are freezing and falling off trees right in front of them. The craziest thing is that they're just paralyzed. They're not dead, obviously. So later, they would come back to life after they, you know, dethaw. Sounds so zombie-like when you say it like that. They're just lying there and then all of a sudden they're like, <gasps> what day is it? Was it a snowfall? Oh God. Winter has come. Number eight, the Philadelphia Experiment. Okay, a little more darker, let's do it. Perhaps one of the most bizarre tales when it comes to other dimensions, this one has credibility behind it. It pops up on my Reddit feed a lot, so I can't help but not talk about it. The 1943 Philadelphia Experiment. This World War II conspiracy theory takes place on the USS Eldridge, this destroyer class ship. So it wasn't small, it was quite large. A lot of people on board, a lot of heads, a lot of witnesses. And they were conducting on this ship these secret experiments in order to gain power over naval warfare, obviously at the time. Now one of these experiments was to create this technology that makes the ship invisible on radar. That's the important note. It was supposed to be invisible on radar. But when the generators were fired up, the hull apparently lit up with this green and blue light, then the ship itself actually disappeared. Invisible in real life, not just on radar. Boom, gone, just like that. It was then seen at a naval shipyard in Virginia before the same thing happened again, and then it appeared 
back in Philadelphia. Now this sounds a bit intense, but when you hear about the crew on board, it only gets worse. Some went mad after the dimensional dip, of course, while others had physical effects from this cosmic commute. Yeah, some haunting details in that one. Some body parts that got mixed up with, yeah, I can't even talk about it. You get it. If you've seen the Cloverfield Paradox, it's kind of like that. Some some bloopin' and blippin', and then some arms getting stuck in some walls. There you go. Number seven, Ellen Shannon. Heading over to the late 1800s for this one. I gotta warn you, it's, of course, pretty dark. In 1870, we obviously didn't have the same safety requirements as we do today for anything, like, at all. For example, if you wanted to read before bed, you didn't have a Kindle or an iPad. Hell, you didn't even have a nightlight, but you did have a kerosene lamp. Always coming in handy, those kerosene lamps. See, Ellen had used R.E. Danforther's non-reactive burning fluid. And dare I say, the obvious happened. The fluid reacted. Yeah, her tomb in Pennsylvania reads, in memory of Ellen Shannon, age 26 years old, who was fatally burned March 21st, 1870, by the reaction of a lamp filled with R.E. Danforther's non-reactive burning fluid. Yeah, they just called him out right there, right in public on the actual tomb. I gotta say, I agree with that. That's cool. If some idiot's gonna cause your horrible demise, yeah, roast them. Let people know. Let people know who's responsible. That's like Twitter nowadays, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, just so-and-so is an asshole. Send tweet. Boop. It's there forever. Number six, military dolphins. Yep, I said military dolphins. Here we are, we're almost halfway through our list. We'll get a little more weird now. Iran has plenty of nuclear capabilities, but they also have trained dolphins now too, so. Good game, folks. Back in 2000, Iran bought this fleet of trained dolphins from Russia. Just Russians doing things. But they were trained, supposedly by the Soviet Union, to attack ships, and yes, you guessed it, attack people. We have Navy SEALs and military dolphins. Is this Aquaman 2? What's happening right now? Well, recently, and I mean that as in 2018 recent, satellite photos revealed a Russian naval base in Syria with pens that are commonly used for holding Dolphins. Yeah, so these dolphins are active, perhaps, right now. That's so terrifying. Russia and the US have a fleet of trained dolphins to detect mines, but now Iran is also in the mix as well. So, three powers in the dolphin game. What an odd standoff that would be in the water. They're all eating at each other. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she tried, but okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car, or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which, in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. 
Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen, so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Number 10, surgical souvenirs. You ever go on a trip and you bring back a shell home with you, right? It's Pretty cute. A little piece of the ocean to remind you of that time that you got food poisoning in Cancun, right? Love it. Put it on a shelf. Hashtag memories. Well, Anubis, the Egyptian god of mummification, he had a similar hobby, it seems. Anubis historically oversaw the embalming process during mummification, which on one hand is probably a pretty sweet job. But Anubis, this ancient wonder that he is, he kept trophies from those that he embalmed. So word spread quickly, Anubis likes body parts, pass it on. And so in turn, for centuries, ancient Egyptians offered pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. Yeah, here you go. Hey, anybody want this arm? Here you go, nice catch. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. He's a big fan of that. He likes to rock that one every single day. Real ominous and terrifying looking, that jackal head. Number nine. The Devourer. I love the name. Right off the hop, The Devourer, right? Straight to the point. Nobody celebrated the end of days like ancient Egyptians. They celebrated death, for death was not the end. Egyptians would often engage in rituals for those who had passed. Of course, explaining mummification, but ideally after this point, historically, your soul would then make its way to the afterlife and search for the hall of truth. Ancient souls have to pass a final test, but if you fail, if your soul fails, well, buddy, I got some bad news for you. Or rather, the the Devourer over there has some bad news for you. Yeah, the Devourer of Amenti, aka Amit. I mean, visually, she is terrifying. Amit has a crocodile's head, a hippo's body, and lion paws to keep you sweating and at bay. Number eight, the final exam. So say you want to avoid meeting the devourer of a mentee. Okay, what's the game plan here? What's this final exam that you have to pass? Is it high jump? If it's high jump, I might be okay. Maybe, depends, you know, on a good day. This final test placed the heart of the recently deceased on a scale. Being a Libra, I actually love this. Your heart was weighed against a white feather, which represented balance. Now, if there was unbalance, a mitt would then eat your entire existence. So yeah, you best behave. Hit that thumbs up or else, you know, you know. Number seven, first for everything. Egyptian gods created other Egyptian gods in creative and beautiful ways. Egyptian mythology says the first ever god, Ra, was born out of the sea. Ra, or Autumn, was eager on having children and creating other gods. But without a partner, and you know, being alone and the universe and all, the process can be quite difficult. It's a lonely road being a god and all, so mythology also shows that Ra did end up having children. He created Shu, the god of air, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. But in order to do so, Ra had to breed with his own shadow. Yeah, his shadow, like Peter Pan, you know what I mean? And in order to give birth, said children were spat out of Ra's mouth. That's pretty bad that's pretty crazy, but it's still not as crazy as a seahorse giving birth. Yeah, I'd rather witness Ra giving birth blah, out of his mouth than a seahorse any day. I'm gonna shoot them out by the millions. Number six, the Lady of Terror. If Ra has you shaking in your boots, wait until you hear about the Lady of Terror. Okay, again, great name. Sekhmet is a lion-headed goddess, so again, appearance-wise, pretty jarring to come across. Now, this goddess got the nickname by controlling diseases. Now, on paper, that sounds like something we could definitely benefit from, but Sekhmet could also spread pestilence and plagues against anybody who pissed her off. So yeah, not ideal. Imagine if your ex could control plagues and pestilence 
pestilence. You know what I mean? Wouldn't be a good time. You'd be Sekhmet's name is derived from the Egyptian word for power, which is just what you want in your local position. Nice. It won't they? Number five, Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially named the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program, launched in 1946 to 1947. An operation to establish an Antarctic research base organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. High Jump included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits, the largely unexplored territory of Antarctica was just the prize. It commenced 1946 and ended in late 1947. Or did it? Also known as Task Force 68, Byrd and his team established the Little America 4 base near three previous bases in the ice. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much of the Antarctic's land surface as possible during this three month operation. Seems like the public thinks that high jump could have been more fishy than we think. Seems like skeptics are leaning towards more of a secret military expedition to the center of the earth type stuff. Yep, apparently there's a mouth to the center of the planet in the Antarctic and there was a secret race to find it. High Jump is still today at the mercy of the internet on whether or not it was a legit project or a secretly funded scientific expedition. Google it up, it's pretty wild and very real. Number four, Ouija boards. Popularized by teens in the 1970s, the Ouija board has earned its reputation over the years. Created almost 100 years before its heightened popularity, the year is 1891. And as the first ads started to appear in papers claiming, quote, Ouija, the wonderful talking board. The title from a Pittsburgh toy and novelty shop. The first paper described it as a magical game that answered questions about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. A flat board with the letters of the alphabet configured in two semicircles. Above, the numbers zero through nine. The words yes and no in the upper corners, goodbye at the bottom. No batteries included nor needed. Now. The origins are pretty messy, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint who or what inspired these early attempts at this game. It kind of just appeared on shelves. No, literally. The Kennard Novelty Company exclusively made and marketed these talking boards, and apparently the lore goes that one of the designer's sisters was a medium and asked the board what it would like to be called. It responded, Ouija, followed by good luck. Well, that's absolutely terrifying. At least good sportsmanship though, right? Yeah, I've never played with one of these, nor will I ever. That's a no brainer for me, 100%. Number three, the Philadelphia experiment. I pray that this one is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around the time that don't really seem to add up. The Philadelphia experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October, 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the U.S. Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer the USS Eldridge and the bizarre scientific results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer successfully made itself invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in Philly. Sounds pretty cool, right? So what's the catch? The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects, including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. Like people stuck in the walls and stuff. Stuck in the floors like this is a scene from Jumanji. Terrifying. The story surfaced in the late 1950s when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a U.S. Navy research organization. The U.S. Navy maintains that there has been no such experiment ever conducted and that the details are highly exaggerated and falsified. Dude, I hope so, because this is horrifying. Number two, wow. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University physicists speculated that if an extraterrestrial civilization was attempting to communicate with us using radio signals, that they might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, Ohio State University assigned the big ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1977, Jerry Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing data and spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The wow signal was the first signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Amon discovered the anomaly, impressed by the result. On the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. Wow. Leading to the event's famous name, 
The signal lasted for a full 72 seconds, and it remains today as the strongest candidate for an ET radio transmission ever detected. And number one, of course, the USS Cyclops. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was a Protus-class collier built for the United States Navy, a huge cargo ship designed for transporting coal. In 1918, the cursed vessel left Rio de Janeiro, heading for Barbados, right around a certain dangerous triangle. Unfortunately, the Voyager was never to be seen again. Named Cyclops after a race of giants from Greek mythology, she was huge and heavy, unmissable by the naked eye. So what happened to her? The loss of the ship and crew still remains the single largest loss of life at sea the United States Navy has ever experienced. Funny thing is, it went right through the Bermuda Triangle, a place where magnetic compasses stop working, ships are never heard from again, and of course the military still refuses to operate and research. Skeptics are quick to say aliens and black holes, but the magnetism surrounding the Bermuda Triangle cases might be a logical explanation. I think they still owe us some explanations, no? I'm looking at you, Freedom of Information Act. Number 10, cursed trumpets. King Tut's trumpets are a pair that were found in the burial chamber of the 18th Dynasty Pharaoh upon discovery. One silver and one bronze, the oldest operational trumpets in the world and the only known surviving examples from ancient Egypt. Both are engraved with images of the gods and both were silent for more than 3,000 years before the trumpets were played for 150 million people live on a BBC broadcast in 1939. And then World War II happened. Yeah, because apparently the curator of the Tut collection at the Egypt Museum says whenever they're played, a war occurs. Yeah. The bronze trumpet was stolen from the museum in Cairo during the looting riots of 2011, and then hilariously enough, returned two weeks later. Yeah, apparently Buddy didn't like the ancient gods just roaming his condo. Uh, you think? Number nine, Annabelle. The most infamous and dangerous possessed doll in the world. Yeah, pretty well all you need to know about that. Found at the home of the Warren's Occult Museum in Connecticut, we know a little bit about this doll with all the films about her. She rests inside a glass case marked warning, positively do not touch. Aggressive, but necessary. Gifted to a nursing student from a thrift store in the 70s, incidents involving levitating onto the table and running around at night, she took the doll to a medium who said it was possessed by a little girl who had passed. Ed and Lorraine were called shortly after and they offered to take it to their home. On the way home, Ed said that the doll was making the car do funny things. Swerving, no power steering, brake checks, Haunted, haunted, yeah. The museum unfortunately shut down in 2019, but the cursed objects seem to be staying put, which the owners even refuse to make eye contact with. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I would definitely Ronaldo that thing across the room if it was running around my apartment 2 a.m. Just field goal it right out the window. Number eight, Travis Walton. The horrifying abduction of Arizona forester Travis Walton. This is my favorite alien abduction case, yet the scariest, hands down. Fire in the Sky, filmed in 1993, does a pretty bang up job at what happened that night. In 1975, Walton and a logging crew were working in the National Forest. Him and six of his coworkers encountered a saucer-shaped craft feet away from their truck, making a high-pitched tone. The curious Walton was then blasted by a light beam and apparently abducted into their ship. The men were terrified and drove off immediately. Walton claims that he then woke up in a hospital room on board, observed by three short, bald creatures, before fighting tirelessly and losing consciousness. He remembers nothing else until he found himself awake, walking along a highway five days later, naked, just wandering the highway in a daze. He's had tons of interviews. Guy was definitely taken. He's also so peaceful about it too. He's just convinced that they tried to heal him from the accidental blast. I check your organs and your pineal gland. Just make sure they're all there and intact, you know? Holy moly. Number seven, werewolves of London. Real werewolves. In the 80s, Lorraine and Ed Warren traveled in search of a real life wolf man. Apparently they were watching a TV show following the life of a local werewolf, Bill Ramsey in London, England, and Lorraine felt a strange connection to him. After a quick trip to London for more answers, she found Bill's whereabouts. Unlike usual werewolf folklore, he didn't transform every full moon and he didn't get bit. Bill Ramsey was apparently possessed by an evil wolf spirit. That's right. It was so bad that he needed a full-blown exorcism. The Warrens brought Bill back to Connecticut to meet Bishop Robert McKenna, and the exorcism was a success. Thanks to everyone involved that day, Bill lives a pretty normal life now, very unpossessed. Yeah, I'd hope so. This is terrifying. 
Imagine that's your neighbor. Yeah, sometimes I change into a werewolf once in a blue moon. I'm Bill, nice to meet you, welcome to the neighborhood. This is a fruitcake. Number six. Osiris. Yet again, something stolen that's very, very old. Why do people steal the oldest, most cursed stuff? The infamous statue of Osiris. In 1971, during an excavation in Saqqara, Egyptologist Walter Brian Emery found a small statue of the Egyptian god of death, Osiris. Emery took the statue of Osiris and once at his house, Emery went to the bathroom to shower. After a few moments, apparently his assistant heard Emery screaming in fear. He found him, clutching the sink, scared to death and paralyzed. Emery was diagnosed with paralysis of the right side of his body and was unable to speak. He died the following day. Uh, yeah, talk about a curse of the pharaohs. Like, buddy, you can't just steal stuff and then just throw it up overseas in a museum. Especially the stuff that clearly says in hieroglyphics, do not remove, this is cursed. It's pretty clear right there. Like, never steal anything ancient, you know? That's just a scary movie like waiting to happen. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they would go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose were victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though long term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like they have everything covered, but back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one. 
fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting sex workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never going to know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10, King Edward VIII. Directly after his father died in 1936, King Edward VIII took the throne, right? That's pretty normal. But the tides quickly turned when, less than a year later, he renounced his position. Now, this was of course a huge scandal right off the bat. This is not something that's taken lightly in the royal family. Turns out the woman responsible for stealing his heart was that of Wallace Simpson, American socialite who had already been divorced once before and was at this point working through her second divorce. So you can only imagine how everybody reacted at that point, right? Oh, how dare she? His proposal to Simpson, of course, caused social and political backlash. The Church of England wasn't so chill with Edward marrying someone who had already been divorced. Yeah, they're not really okay with that. So Edward was forced to abdicate. Yeah, he had to, right, for love. Edward and Simpson then tied the knot in 1937, and they stayed together until Edward's death much later in 1972. Sliding into royal DMs right off the hop. Okay, we're in for a treat. Number nine, dark predictions. Of course, in recent years, the royal family has seen a change that many didn't really expect. When Harry and Meghan chose to renounce their royalty status, speculation began that this could be the beginning of the end for the monarchy. People only fueled their fire with questions and also, somebody may have called it. Yeah, not Stradamus. He may have predicted this entire event. One of his predictions literally reads, at the end of the war, the great powers change. Near the coast are born three beautiful children. They will ruin the town when they come of age. They will change the kingdom and they will not see it grow anymore. Now, Harry is only one of two children, so I'm not sure if the, you know, quote was talking about him and his siblings or if it has more to do so with some other royal family members. But either way, there's some people who take Nostradamus' words very, very seriously out there. So I had to include it. Maybe there's something there. I don't know. Maybe there's something we haven't quite breaking down yet. That's why we need National Treasure 3. You know, maybe this is the plot. Number eight, King Henry II. While we're on the topic of him, could Nostradamus have actually predicted the death of King Henry II? Because if he did, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty curious, I'd say. Never used the word curious in my life, but I'm like, you know what? That's curious. King Henry II was actually a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be kind of cool, being friends with Nostradamus. I'd be like, hey, how does Game of Thrones end? Please. While at one point in history, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible King Henry of France, unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death, might I add, at age 40. Yeah, in the summer of 1559, not a great time. A terrible jousting accident went wrong and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I have to explain because, you know, it's history. And well, that's what we're here for. The jousting accident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and then his skull as well by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. It says he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Okay, already we're a little bit spooky. And that two wounds will ensure a cruel death. So I'm not saying he predicted it. I'm just saying, eh. Kinda nailed it. Number seven, a fateful turn of events. Queen Victoria, her reign began back in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death in 1901. Now at just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. Had to, right? All these cases, it's like, yeah, they have to do this. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819, and Queen Victoria was actually fifth in line when she was born, nowhere near the throne. So right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever see the crown. But one by one, all of her family members began passing away fast. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and her grandfather both died one week apart from one another. So on one hand, obviously it's sad, it's tragic, everyone's dealing with loss so fast. But on the other hand, by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next up to bat for the throne at 11. Imagine, that's like some ancient Egypt. Number six, the Great Irish Famine. The Great Irish Famine took out 
many, many people. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on were suddenly no longer available. See, a group of microorganisms wiped them out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. Now, it was draconian law and British ruling at this point that made the exported food hard to reach people. That's where things stopped. This famine led to Irish independence, of course, and anti-union movements. And the show Victoria pulled back zero punches in 2017, where an episode showed the true happenings behind the Great Irish Famine and the role that Queen Victoria played in coming to the aid of her then subjects. It was the death of at least one million people. This was a very dark seven years in Irish history. Historian Christine Keenly spoke out and says, quote, there is no evidence that she had any real compassion for the Irish people in any way. Yikes. That's a historian saying that. That's, that's, that's how you know. At number eight, mental health. Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up, and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems, even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. At number seven, grave robber. When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular, though questionable, profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver. And since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number six, beauty. I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead-based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harms people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes, and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number five, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According to to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman, because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out, and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number four, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide, and hormone-free food 
mode is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster of Paris, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies, copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine, mercury was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. At number three, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. Gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text described mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. And finally at number one, baby farmers. Now for what I believe is probably the most disturbing thing from the Victorian era, baby farmers. Basically, this was an industry of women who would take unwanted babies and either take care of them, give them to new parents, or unfortunately have them disposed of. One famous case of the darker side of baby farmers comes from a woman named Amelia Dyer. She was known to have charged women a lot of money to take their babies off their hands, but unfortunately, the one survive Amelia's care. It is believed that Amelia was responsible for the passings of hundreds of making her one of the biggest monsters of the Victorian era. Number 10, let's start out setting the scene. So rather than rank the least to worst aspects of this year, let's set the scene of how this became the worst year. Prior to 536, the early 500s were in some pretty heavy transitions. The Western Roman Empire had fallen to German invaders, and the Eastern sect would soon follow suit. The Middle East was divided between the Byzantine and the Persian empires. China's influence continued to spread through East Asia, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, even even though it was experiencing a weak point, China was divided into both North and South territories and they were constantly at odds with each other. Africa, however, was developing trade routes through the Sahara and a powerful new kingdom was arising in Ethiopia. They wouldn't be heavily affected by this, but part of them would be. Peasants throughout Europe were used to the tradition of harvest seasons being reliable until one day all this movement and all this growth stopped. Number 9, The Mist. A mysterious mist rolled in over Europe, clouding the sky in darkness. With the mist, a century of darkness would fall. Literally sounds like the setting of a Stephen King novel. Byzantine historian Procopius wrote about a portent that took place that year and said this, and I quote, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse. For the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, men were free neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. The sun was eclipsed for 18 months. For three hours in the morning it would give light, but a light that resembled neither day nor night." Unquote. Other sources describe a cloud or dust veil that darkened the sky. 
Now, why did this happen? Here we are at number eight, eruption. Now, what on earth could have caused such a mysterious cloud of depression to seize the land? Well, after centuries of mystery, scientists have finally discovered what happened. It was a massive volcanic eruption that took place in Iceland. A professor of medieval history at Harvard University, Michael McCormick, led a study of a Swiss glacier which led to the discovery. Evidence of volcanic matter in the glacier proved that it was indeed a massive eruption that caused it. The ash from the eruption likely led to a fog that caused an 18 month period of darkness. It was so vast it spread across all of Europe, the Middle East and portions of Asia. Number 7 Climate Impact This period of ominous and unexplained darkness led to serious negative transformations. A Roman politician by the name of Cassiodorus wrote that the sun looks bluish and that the moon had no luster. The seasons also seemed to be jumbled together into one. No summer, no spring, just a long, ever gloomy middle winter kind of thing. Another eerie fact he added was, and I quote, We marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, unquote. The dark sunless days brought periods of cold, with temperatures falling as low as 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius all year round, making it the coldest decade in the past 2300 years. This is the closest the world got to the winter depicted in Game of Thrones, besides the actual Ice Age of course. This was called the Mini Antique Ice Age. Number 6 Starvation But with the extreme cold, lack of sunlight and seasons, crop failure destroyed many lives. Farmers no longer could look forward to a bountiful harvest in the fall as basically nothing survived. The Irish chronicles show that they had a failure of bread, bread of all things, from the years 536 to 539. Europe, parts of Asia and the Middle East experienced a massive famine crisis. When did things get back to normal? Well it took over a century for things to really start to turn back. Eventually grit fell from the sky and slightly warmer temperatures returned, allowing for some crops to return. But the people had no way of knowing when that was going to happen, they just had to keep slugging along every day watching their friends and families slowly die of starvation. Not a good time to be alive. Number 5 huh, The Plague of Justinian but things weren't about to get any better anytime soon. It wasn't just crop failure and famine they had to worry about. Soon the bubonic plague was upon them. A couple years later in 541 the bubonic plague swept across Europe adding more woe to misery. It became known as the plague of Justinian as it swept through the Roman port of Pelusium, Egypt causing the deaths of half the eastern Roman empire's population. This in turn according to once again Michael McCormick sped up the final demise of the once great empire. The plague struck Asia, North Africa, Arabia, and Europe, taking the lives of a colossal 30 to 50 million people. And now there weren't that many people back then, so this would have really, really made a dent. The same disease would return centuries later and would be known as the Black Death. The reason it was called the Plague of Justinian this time around was due to the poor response from the Byzantine ruler. He was unable to complete the projects he had started due to the farmers and workers dying by the thousands, so he decided to raise taxes and change the tax code. He not only demanded taxes from the people still alive, but demanded they pay the ones owed by their fallen neighbors as well. So not a good time. Number 4 Some benefits There were some. Now those scientists like to say this is the worst time to be alive in history. It depends where you were and it depends where you live. I mean I keep thinking that maybe World War II was probably worse or World War I, I just don't know. But it was just such a long extended period of time. If you lived in the Arabian Peninsula however, you may have actually been kind of grateful for it, you know? Due to the catastrophe, their weather changed for the good. They actually experienced more rainfall. This helped their crop and vegetation thrive. They had so much left over, they could give more to their camels. As a result, they were able to build larger camel herds to help facilitate transport for Arab armies aiding in conquests during that century. It also may have influenced agricultural development in Estonia with their production of rye. In Finland, hunting and fishing were their main sources of livelihood, so the lack of land production didn't really bother them. They were like, okay, cool, I've got this uh, reindeer. Number three, snow in China. China, on the other hand, was freaking the heck out. It snowed in the summer. In the summer! I cannot imagine like a more depressing thing to happen, okay? I like I really can't. I mean, I remember one time in May, it snowed after like two weeks of just like beautiful weather and it snowed again after the longest winter. It was the most depressing moment of my life. Anyways, in some parts of China, the weather was so bad that 70 to 80% of the population 
starved to death. So on top of the famine, it was the weather and all this stuff. Despite this event though, South China seemingly remained peaceful and prosperous under the Liang dynasty which lasted from 502 to 49. However, economic pressures and internal strife within the Northern Wei Empire continued to cause trouble. The Northern Zhao was finally defeated in 581 and the South asserted control over the North. This led to the final linking of North and South China when Emperor Wen began construction of a canal system connecting the two parts of China together. Number 2 Economic Downturn So obviously with the fact that agricultural production was way way down, workers were dying left right and center, an economic downturn soon followed the wave of plague and the mist. As previously mentioned, rulers such as Justinian raised taxes like crazy, burying his empire in debt. But just how bad did it get? Well, the study of seeds found in excavations tell a pretty bleak story. They found a high number of grape seeds in the ancient trash mound. So what does that matter? Well, by going through each seed individually, that's dedication. They noticed a steep rise in the amount they found and then all of a sudden a steep decline of grape pips. The Byzantine Empire for instance was pretty well known for the sweet wine that they sold and they had connections with other like parts of Europe that they sold it to which means the steep decline in the seeds indicates that their economic ties took a huge hit. Number 5 Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self pleasure was a big no no. Commonly called self pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his chair or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just as long as the bedroom doors close, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Because with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child. Am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls to the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, Everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self pollution was a big no no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day. Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore though. 
Number 1. Rising Action This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's going to be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it. Uh, had their toes curled. Reaching the peak. Your magnum opus. The way I feel when I eat at McDonald's. DEFCON 1. Or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms. But that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Because science. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era. And who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more. We need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling? Yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over the corner looks pretty lonely, and boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. 
With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number five, the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the, well, clearly the very excited Challenger crew right before when they were walking down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. Now, this photo is chilling, but it's nice to see them happy and together. The crew even included, at the time, 37-year-old Kristen McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. You may remember this, but your parents definitely do. See, she had won a spot on the mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space Program, and she had trained diligently for months in order to to be the first ever non-military individual in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful to 73 seconds after liftoff. See, two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures that morning, and on live television, the world had to watch as a spacecraft broke apart and then fell into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everybody on board the craft. Now, I'm not sure if you've watched the documentary on Netflix, but it's a mini-series about this whole thing and it's powerful stuff. It's really emotional, I just finished it and it's moving. Number four, the core. <clears throat> this photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew and while this photo looks relatively normal and scientific or whatever, a non-threatening photo, what he has in his hands is truly devastating. It changed history. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man. Yeah, that thing. This means that Harold is now holding the nuclear core of the atomic weapon that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast took many, many lives, as well as the long-term effects of radiation illnesses. Now, it's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems so perfectly normal when he literally has a life-changing, world-ending device in the palm of his hand, like a literal supervillain holding kryptonite. I couldn't imagine seeing that, let alone holding it. No way. My grandmother wouldn't even hold me as a baby because I was too small and fragile. <laughs> Think she'd hold this? No way. Butterfingers. Butterfingers galore over there. Number three, the ball of burning men. January 28th, 1393, you are formally invited to a masquerade ball. How fun is that? <laughs> Who is it under that mask? Oh, it's just Taylor on Bumblebee. Love him. He's great. The French queen Isabeau of Bavaria is now hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade, right? So bring your finest and longest crook house. Roll it in style. Now, when the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the queen's ladies in waiting, it of course was a big deal. It's fun. It's a big happy day. For some, the best days of their lives. For others at this ball, not so great. Probably the last days of their lives. King Charles Charles VI had five companions perform a dance or a theater routine of sorts. Now they did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bin, right? They had these big, lovely masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were real beasts. Now the party was going well, wine was spilling, people were laughing, beasts were roaring, we were committed, but one rule beforehand was put into place before the party started. Absolutely, positively, no open flames. Obviously, right? I mean, look at that guy. He looks like a couch. We're not gonna put a match near him. It's gonna be chaos. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event, and he forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. He wanted to see everyone. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of said beasts. Either way, this tragic event took the lives of four people, hence the name, Ball of the Burning Men. That's terrible, imagine that, what a gig. Number two, the Stanford Prison Experiment. One of the most well-known experiments of all time was the Stanford Prison Experiment. It was an attempt to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power, and it worked. A little too well, I'd say. Guards and prisoners were all chosen randomly from college students to anyone, your neighbor. You had no idea. Nobody really knew just how bad this experiment would end up, so anyone volunteered. Those in power were taking it to an extreme level. It was absolute psychological distress. Some of the prisoners went insane. The whole exercise was abandoned after only six days, which is not a short amount of time, but historians say just six days because it was intended to last much longer. Now, it's shocking to see the lengths people go after receiving power over another human being. I thought I was evil unplugging my brother's controller and like playing, you know, and he wasn't plugged in. This is like, 
Next level. And finally, number one, mummified pets. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below which animals fill your house. We love that. Olivia and I want to get a dog so bad. I was always a dog guy growing up. My aunt had three pugs. It was the dream. I love it. Ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two. We know this. But Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods, which I do too with my shih tzu, of course. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians, so thank you. Egyptians were, of course, fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. But did you know they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and baboons? Yeah, baboons. That's amazing. Go ask your parents for a baboon as a pet. There you go. I thought dogs doing their business inside was annoying, but a lion? Your arm's gonna be tired scooping that one up. Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they'd passed, just like how many owners today cremate their pets. I mean, I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Who am I to judge? Other creatures were specially trained to work as helper animals back then, so ancient Egyptian police officers officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling, and then mummify them. What a time, imagine that. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria, who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you heard it, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 8, Shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. This makes any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. 
When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair, not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC, is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified, and once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise, hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that Shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I like got our producer Chris. I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October. October 1257, and scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly. It was far too cold for them to even stand a chance. And it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Now yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, Plague Bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now, bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers? Show of hands. Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johan, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe. And with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table, boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot. Like a lot, a lot. Number 10. John Mack. In the early 90s, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychologist named Dr. John E. Mack made the jump from diagnosing ordinary psychological conditions to researching apparent alien abductees and their stories and experiences surrounding UFOs. Yep, Google it up. It's actually terrifying. 
and very real. Apparently cases studied by Mac and abduction sometimes get involved with hypnosis. This guy was a tenured professor since the 50s at Harvard. He did his research. The UFO abduction rabbit hole led him to interviewing and studying more than 200 people who insist that they were taken. At first he was trying to crack the psychosis of the subject, but after studying and funding from the Rockefellers, private donors and universities, he wrote numerous books on the phenomena and its strangeness. Again, tenured and Pulitzer Prize winner. He sadly passed in 2004 from a drunk driver. His life and death holds heavy conspiracy debate around it. Check it out, it's uh, a little bit strange. Number nine, Sophia. We've seen her on Fallon, we've seen her on breakfast television. She still looks like a bad cyberpunk character, doesn't she? Sophia by Hanson Robotics, the most advanced human-like robot that we have. Well, actually this is like their 12th one. This is the world's first robot citizen. Literally. Not only is she considered a citizen, she has a credit card and a seat in the UN. Like what? In 2016, Sophia premiered on the Jimmy Fallon show playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, simple stuff. Two years later, she's harmonizing with Jimmy live. Also, they didn't sing Mr. Roboto. Like, I just feel like that was a huge missed opportunity there. Like, where are the writers, dude? I've seen the Terminator and Ex Machina, and at the Web Summit presentation in 2018, Sophia and her brother Han glitched out on stage and had a terrifying, cryptic, non-coherent conversation, joking about ending the world. Yeah, it's horrifying, you gotta check it out. Dude, I feel like Furbies were their first try, and now they got these like brat dolls mini Sophia's coming out soon. Like, where's this going? Number eight, Arthur Flowerdew. James Arthur Flowerdew was born in England in 1906. Grew up, paid his taxes, lived a pretty normal life. At about the age of 12, he began to have strange recurring dreams and hallucinations though. Over time, crystallizing into a very clear and vivid image. Dreams riddled with stone cities, carvings and cliffs, and vast deserts. He didn't understand what it all meant. One day, as an old man, he was watching a documentary on the BBC on the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. He was stunned. This was the city he had always seen. He called the BBC and asked them to interview him. Archaeological experts and the Jordanian government even invited him to come out to Jordan, where he continued to even baffle experts. Flowerdew was able to find his way around the city without a map, giving precise details on landmarks and even pointing out undiscovered locations. Yeah, here's the scary part. After all of this, he was convinced that he had lived an entire previous life in ancient times and was reincarnated in the 20th century. Number seven, Proctor's Ledge. Over 1,000 documents from Salem's witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. For more than 300 years, it was believed that the 19 people who were accused, tried, and executed in the Salem witch trials of 1692 were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked out, but no actual marker of the execution site. Hmm, that's odd. A team of researchers began to reconsider the evidence in 2010 and eventually concluded it was the right spot. Yeah, oopsies. Actually, the real execution spot was called Proctor's Ledge. Also, eerie name for where they hang people, isn't it? It was confirmed in 2016 by scientists after ground penetrating data and writings from 1692 that it wasn't the actual location of the brutality. I know what you're thinking. It's named after John Proctor. No, no it's not. However, really odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft. Locals say that the ghost named the Lady in White visits Proctor's Ledge often, which now makes sense with the whole we found the right spot stuff. Visitors claim to have caught sightings of her and even catch her disembodied voice. Yeah. Number six, props. Elmer McCurdy was an American outlaw, running with a small crew, banking and train robbing the Wild West until he was killed in a shootout with sheriffs after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Famously known as the bandit who wouldn't give up, his mummified body was first put on display at an Oklahoma funeral home before being an amusement, traveling carnival show to carnival show during the 1920s right through the 1960s. After changing ownership several times, McCurdy's remains eventually wound up at the Pike Amusement Zone in Long Beach, California. His corpse was then used as a prop, but then discovered by a film crew on a set of The Six Million Dollar Man. They were positively identified in 1976, and the following year, 1977, Elmer McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest at the Summit View Cemetery in Oklahoma. McCurdy's fingers were apparently so damaged that detectives couldn't even pull a fingerprint. The coroners had to x-ray his teeth and measure his bones to ID him. His pockets included a bullet, 
a sunny amusement museum of crime ticket, a newspaper article, and a 1924 penny. Yeah, that's terrible. Just weekend at burning him for like 60 years set to set? Not really knowing it's a real body? People will do anything for money. Number five, book burning. This is one of the more tragic stories, but it's gotta be talked about. During Qin Shi Huang's rule, Chancellor Li Shi convinced the emperor that all records excluding the Qin needed to be burned. Not only that, but anyone possessing copies of the Shi Jing, the Shu Jin, and or any other writings from the hundred schools of philosophy had to turn their copies in for summary roasting or they'd get whacked. Not only that, but he suggested a mass state of censorship, which was the actual censorship and not the kind that you uh, right wing morons whine about happening in video games or whatever. Hmm? Basically anyone who referenced the books, talked about them in any way, or god forbid used them to criticize the government, were to be borked brutally and quickly. Qin Shi Huang thought this was a great idea and got to work erasing thousands thousands of collections of poetry, history, and philosophy. He even went out of his way to execute 460 scholars whom he just happened to overhear complaining about his stupid new rules. I would weep about this loss for hours, but poet Zhang Ji's work titled Pits for Book Burning is far better for it than I. Quote, As the smoke from burning bamboo and silk clears, the empire is weakened. The Hangu Pass and the Yellow River guard the domain of Qin Shi Huang in vain. Pits of ash were not yet cold, disorder reigned east of the Zhao Mountains. As it turned out, Liu Bang and Zhang Yu could not read. Number four, high speed cultural revolution. We've said it already, but it really can't be overstated that the speed in which Qin Shi Huang implemented new cultural rules and laws was absolutely incredible. Even the Meiji Restoration period that effectively brought Japan into what was considered the modern age for that time, it took about around 21 years. And that was a messy affair that could get an entire video by itself. But consider the relative population contained within China. Consider the size of China and the size of the Qin Empire. All of this territory was shaped by a period of about a decade and a half, to the point where it wouldn't be until 1912 that there would be a major upheaval to the system. Obviously, it saw improvisation, adaptation, and change over the years, but just as Qin Shi Huang was laying the foundation for a wall that he envisioned would span the entirety of China, I wonder if he knew that the system of government that he was implementing would last nearly as long. Of course, the means by which this was achieved involved massive cultural manipulation and fascistic ideals, not to mention the body count. Actually, no, let's mention that. Number three, the body count of Qin rule. Okay, now while the Qin dynasty was important, it should be noted that the results of such a tyrannical rule were bloody indeed. Between high taxes, wars of conquest, and the beginning of the construction of the Great Wall, historians estimate that around 20 million people passed during Qin rule. An absolutely staggering number given, again, its decade and a half duration. The construction of the wall alone was estimated to have contributed to a around 1 million of those, and it wasn't finished until long after Qin fell. It's a sobering reminder to keep in mind that while acts of war are devastating, the management or mismanagement of those in power can be far more destructive. Number two, Qin Shi Huang's quest for immortality. So it uh, turns out it ain't great to be king. As his reign continued, Qin Shi Huang's paranoia increased, only emboldened as three consecutive attempts on his life were made. This paranoia turned to obsession with the elixir of life, a fabled drink which might imbue him with immortality. His quest led him on a search for the Penglai Mountain, where a thousand-year-old magician had supposedly invited him. Qin Shi Huang had also ordered an expedition to search for the elixir, but they uh, never returned, likely due to being afraid of the consequences for returning empty-handed. It's actually suspected that uh, some of them did escape to Japan and may have settled there, though accounts in this area are pretty 
week. Anyways, in uh, 211, a meteor landed in Donjun, and some cheeky bugger inscribed the words, the first emperor will die and his lands will be divided. Since nobody took credit for the masterful prank, everyone in the area was executed, and the stone destroyed. Finally, Qin Shi Hong passed, potentially due to illness, but as many fun stories go, it's actually rumored that he was killed by a seditious physician with a false elixir containing mercury. Number 1. Li Shi's Return It's fortunate that the end of the Qin Empire is as interesting as its beginning. Qin Shi Hong is dead, and Li Shi and chief eunuch Zhao Gao have to somehow keep everything together. For starters, there was the job of getting the Emperor's body back, which they handled by hiding it in a caravan of dead fish. Seriously. But they had another problem. They just flat out didn't want the Emperor's choice of successor, Fu Su, to take the throne, as it'd probably mean that they'd lose their jobs. So betraying the newly passed Emperor, they tricked Fu Su into taking his own life by giving him a falsified document from his dad that just told him to do it. Zhao Gao then betrayed Li Shi, charging him with treason, and the conspirator was subjected to the five punishments. Mo, where the offender is tattooed on the face with ink, Yi, where the offender's nose is cut off, Yu, or Yue, where the offender's feet are cut off, Gong, where the offender's are removed, and finally Da Pi, which was carried out by chopping at the waist. It'd be easy to say that Li Si was half the man he aimed to be, but just please cut the joke here, that was really stupid. Starting our list off at number 10, Lake Neos. We love talking about Pompeii, we can't get enough of it. I'm fascinated. They have a restaurant that's back and open now in Pompeii, it's crazy. Now that's quite the eruption, historically, that's a bad one, that's pretty scary. But a recent eruption in 1986, well we don't talk about this one enough. First of all, a limnic eruption is a rare event, so you can sleep not in fear tonight. It occurs when CO2 dissolved in deep water lakes suddenly erupts. Cause uh, yeah, that can happen, who knew that? That's why I don't like lakes. There you go, right there. These events have only been observed twice, the deadliest being Lake Neos in 1986. When a limnic eruption occurs, large clouds of CO2 form, which then all of a sudden descend and drop below the oxygen in the air, causing all living things in the vicinity to choke and not survive anymore. In this case, the cloud fell on nearby villages, ultimately causing the deaths of 1,700 people and 3,500 livestock. Number 9. The Spanish Flu of 1918. The Spanish Flu of 1918. Okay, yeah, this one's probably pretty good. Since we know a little something about plagues now in real life and toilet paper and stress, let's turn the clocks back 95 years when the Spanish Flu entered the game. What was it like back then? The Spanish Flu, if you didn't know, it was a strain of the H1N1 virus, which we all know as well. And when it hit, it took 50 to 100 million people. Very fast. 4% of the world's population gone. Now, it was recent and it was quite horrible. We couldn't stay home and watch Ozark for that one, so instead, the Spanish flu is said to have spread so violently because of soldiers being in close quarters during World War I. Yeah, again, very different than our plague. Immune systems were shot as is, and you're telling me a plague rolled through while we're in trenches? No way, what a nightmare. But just like that, the virus disappeared. Better treatment, perhaps it mutated into a much weaker strain. Either way, Great, stay gone, get out of here, go away and stay there, pal. Hit that thumbs up for the Spanish flu not being around. Awesome, we love that, it's a good one to not have. Number eight, the great dying. This name's pretty accurate, if I'm being honest myself. Scariest environment imaginable, here we go. Turning the clocks and solar system back 252 million years ago, the Permian Triassic extinction, which for convenience sake we'll call the great dying, was and hopefully shall remain the largest extinction event on earth. The fact that we're even alive right now, watching this video, clicking that thumbs up and subscribing, well, it's all pretty rare, all things considered. This was a butterfly effect triggered by a massive volcanic eruption around the Serbian traps in Russia. A runaway greenhouse effect was responsible for the loss of 95% of all marine life and 70% of all land animals. That's so everything pretty much. Pretty much everything's gone. Temperatures rose as the sea began to absorb large quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. Mentioned that a little earlier and that could not be great. And it began turning into carbonic acid, hence all that marine life that didn't make it. Methane hydrate then started to bubble from the ocean surface which is 
horrifying to imagine, and it raised the temperature even higher at that point. Now, imagine if this didn't happen. We'd have those scary sharks still swimming around. We're remnants of the surviving 4% of the great dying. Yeah, tell all your friends that. I'm gonna add that to my LinkedIn. That sounds not half bad. Yeah, I survived the great dying, so yeah. Really good at scooping ice cream. Let's do it. Number seven, Maximilien Robespierre. On July 27th, 1794, French revolutionary Maximilien Robespierre and 21 of his followers were all arrested at the Hotel de Ville in Paris. Now, considering that this was 1794 and we got arrested, what follows is sure to be a public nightmare. The next day, Robespierre and again, 21 of his followers were all taken to the Palace de Revolution where they were all executed by guillotine before a cheering crowd. Always a cheering crowd, of course. What, are, what else are we doing today? Let's go watch. What history tends to leave out of this part is that Maximilian tempted to take his own life beforehand because he knew his fate was gonna suck with the whole, you know, thing. But when he tried to take his own life, he survived and was left instead with a nasty jaw wound. So in Game of Thrones fashion, the executioner, when the time came, ripped the jaw bandage off first and then he saw the guillotine. Yeah, again, to a cheering crowd, remember? They all watched this, all of this unfold. I can't even watch UFC sometimes. You're telling me people watch this? IRL? That's, I'm gonna go throw up real quick. Be right back. Number six. The eruption. Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines, was another volcanic eruption that shook up history. A little more recent than the other one, this was on June 15th, 1991. Mount Pinatubo, this massive volcano, erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Impressive? Yes. Terrifying? Absolutely. Yep, this is very loud and scary. Activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd, 1991. And these things take a little time to, you know, finish up. So that same year, researchers set up seismographs in the area. And by June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions. And then on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent hot ash 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere, which then rained on down to everything around it, which is the worst thing I can imagine. Additional smaller eruptions continued continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. And then on June 15th, the volcano once again went off, this time sending a cloud of ash 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. So bye bye sun for a little bit. This one's gonna linger. Number five, the Perrin family. In 1952, Ed and Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. They quickly gained notoriety after this next case. The Parents. In 1971, the Parent family, Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Rhode Island. At first, items started disappearing, then the ghostly sightings started. It was discovered that the home had some previous sinister owners. Self-emulation, freak accidents, and of course, murder in the attic. Whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of the house, and she resented the competition my mother posed. The parents asked the Warrens to come in more than 10 separate times to help against this sinister, ghastly entity. During one seance, Carolyn was possessed, even rising from the ground while sitting in a chair. Andrea, the oldest daughter, said, My mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not of her own. Then her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room. Yeah, just zipping around the house, floating around on a chair like the Jetsons? Yeah, no thank you, that's like haunted, haunted. Just bulldoze that thing, would you? Number four, the ring. One ring to rule them all. The vine ring, AKA the ring of Silvianus, is a gold ring from the fourth century AD. The ring was discovered on a farm in 1785 in England. First, the property of a British Roman named Silvianus. Apparently, it was stolen by a person named Senecianus, upon which Silvianus Hex the ring with a curse. In 1929, during excavations of the site, archaeologists discovered the now curse that goes with said ring, consulting shortly after with one J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm. The band of the ring has 10 edges. Among it is the goddess Venus engraved, along with the words, live in God. The lore goes, Sylvianus's ring was stolen by someone named Senecianus. Sylvianus created and hexed a tablet, which he wrote, for the god Nodens. Sylvianus has lost a ring that has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named Senecianus, permit no good health until it's returned to the temple of Nodens. Yeah, that sounds like a spell to me, dude. And Noden is like Poseidon, so you don't want any of that smoke. Number three, a haunting in Connecticut. Based on all real case endpoint, a 2009 gem. 
the accounts of the horrific case of the Snedekers who moved into a ghost infested house in Connecticut, unknowingly moving into one of the most sinister haunted funeral homes on earth. At first, mom notices items missing, but that's just the start. Then the children started to see strange people in their home, and then their son started to act a little strange. Violent outbursts, physical attacks on his own family, Maybe he was becoming the next victim to the house's grim history. After months of scary stuff going on, the Warrens were finally called in and turned out the morticians that had lived there previously had practiced some abysmally sinister acts on some lifeless bodies, deepening the home into the hell it was now sold as. An exorcism or two later, and the house finally became a home again. The case can be reimagined in 2009's Haunting in Connecticut, where the story follows the story drawn out by the Snedekers all those sinister years ago. Yo, Taylor gets possessed, I'm swinging immediately. You know what I mean? Like so many holy hands right away, just. Number two, Statue of Lem. The Women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while possessing the carved stones. The first owner, along with his entire family, died within six years of owning the statue, all of mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners also died, of course, along with their entire families, just a few short years after obtaining the statue. The fourth owner died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the rock. Now, a gift to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, it's encased in glass, safe, and unable to bear any other family bad omens. And number one, the mummy. My number one spot, of course, this is the most terrifying find of all. In 1991, a 5,000 year old frozen preserved human mummy was discovered in the frozen Otzel Apse of Italy. Otzi, of course, is the name the researchers chose to name this mummy for obvious location reasons. Otzi, though, is believed to have been murdered before being frozen in time due to the discovery of an arrowhead embedded in his left shoulder, various wounds on his body, and also the blood soaked tunic he's wearing with multiple people's DNA on it. Maybe in combat, maybe from megafauna. Who knows? Scientists believe that he's the oldest known naturally preserved mummy on Earth. This is where it's gonna get spooky. Once unearthed, a curse surfaced too, and grew stronger as people linked to him began to die one after another in violent freak accidents. So far, seven deaths have been tied or related to Otzi's de-thawing, including forensic pathologist who was killed in a car accident en route to give a speech about Otzi, a mountaineer in an avalanche, a hiker who discovered the Iceman falling down a treacherous path, the molecular archaeologist was found dead in his home, the head of the forensic team had a heart attack, another discoverer died of a sudden brain tumor, and another of multiple sclerosis. Yo, say what you will about curses, when people start dropping all involved with the find, I'd say it's probably the 5,000 year old mummy you just found. You think? Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure, then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it, I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of horrible. In the middle ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before 
where we had surnames. Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, Meghan Markle, solo strut. Okay, back in May 2018, we all set our alarms. We woke up early and we all watched the royal wedding, right? We sipped our tea in our pajamas and we pretended like we were there, right? Just watching along with the other billions of people online. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, his new duchess. At the historic wedding, Thomas Markle was just a no-show. Yeah, Meghan just walked down that aisle by herself in front of a billion people watching at home or streaming it. And it was thought at the time that this was because of Thomas's health. See, right before the wedding, Thomas suffered a heart attack, right? Just days before. So of course nobody was upset. It was almost expected for him not to show up. But cut to a year later, we began talking again. Thomas and the Duchess are now not close, it seems. Thomas even spoke out against his own daughter at one point. There was a huge scandal where Meghan even spoke to Oprah, like Oprah and that big tell-all. And Meghan actually said to her father, if you tell me the truth about working with paparazzi, we can help. And he wasn't able to do that, and for me, has really resonated, especially now as a mother, end quote. So yeah, they're not talking, I guess, anymore. Which, more than fair. If my dad was working with the paparazzi, showing them private letters, I'd be a little pissed too. There's no way though. The guy can't even unlock his email, let alone sending one. No way. Number four, Prince Charles and Princess Diana's divorce. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla Parker before his divorce from his first wife, of course, Princess Diana. Imagine having a, like, this is crazy. A princess? You cheated on a princess? That's insane. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed the relationship and what's happening during, you know, that famous 1995 interview with BBC. She couldn't have said it better, if I'm being honest. Diana said herself, quote, well, there's three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Yeah, end quote. There's no better way of putting it, I think. That's a pretty, it's a pretty baller way of saying it. I don't know. I haven't said baller in like 13 years, but I'm like, you know what? That's a baller move. It's pretty gangster. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles. So everybody was busy looking 
other directions, it seems. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only one year before her tragic car accident. Now, later in 2005, Charles ended up marrying Camilla. Has anyone seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looked great in that movie, and now I wanna watch it. Is it worth the watch? Let me know in the comments. I didn't see it go to theaters or anything. It kinda of snuck by me. I was sleeping on all the good ones. Number three, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube isn't a fan of some words, specifically one word that rhymes with Yahtzee, and it goes deep with history, as you could assume what I'm talking about. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, right? The Duke was always referred to as a bad boy, right? He was the bad royal, the bad boyo royal. I don't know, I'm trying new shit here. But just how deep did these incidents cut? Well, before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology back in 2005, because, uh, whoops, somebody got photos from a costume party, and, a uh, few of them were in poor taste. Did the royal dress up as the beast from Beauty and the Beast? No, no he did not. Did he dress up like a witch? Like a little witch, uh, maybe with a, with a nice witch broom? No, none of that either. No, photos leaked of him wearing World War II German soldier gear. Yeah, I can't say too much, but it was even equipped with an armband, a very bad armband. Again, I can't say too much, you know, nor will YouTube allow us to show too much, but you understand what I'm trying to say. You remember. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way he wanted. He's a literal prince. And he does this, it's off-putting. Harry said afterwards, and I quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. End quote. Nice, right from the heart, that's good. Really goes deep with the royal history. We love it. Number two, Vegas getaway. Nice, roll those dice. It's one thing to party like a rock star, but to party like a prince? What does that even mean? I gotta keep this Prince Harry train going because, well, now I'm mad at him, but there's even more photos from history that show what was really going down in the royal family, you know? His priorities dare I say. After that party incident, just seven years later, scandalous photos emerged from Harry's Las Vegas trip. Yeah, I had a little boys night, it seems. It turns out what happens in Vegas may just leak online for your entire family to see and your grandmother. That's probably not a great time. These scandalous pics were taken during a strip pool game. Lovely, we like that. Make sure you call the right pocket while you're not wearing any. The scandal actually prompted St. James Palace to contact the Press Complaints Commission before the snaps even made their way to British tabloids. Yeah, they knew right off the bat they were fucked. They're like, uh, can we call them? Can we send a pigeon? What's the fastest? And finally, number one, Boy Jones and other attempts. Okay, being the queen and all in history, a security team is always needed, obviously. And during her reign, specifically Queen Victoria, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. First attack was in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford and he fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, of course, afterwards, he was actually found not guilty due to, you guessed it, insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her, both also Missed. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, might I add, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. Then these incidents kept occurring again in 1842, 1849, and 1872. Attempt after attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse, and dare I say, a little bit more weird. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened there, I saved it for last because it's so, so horribly creepy. I teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841 and his name was Edward Jones. Edward Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once, right? Before Assassin's Creed came out, no idea how we thought of this. Guy just knows the route in and he would break in and would hide under the queen's sofa. That was his go-to spot. Or he would sometimes just sit on her throne. And one of the worst things ever, sometimes he would go through her drawers. He would go through the queen's drawers. That's so gross. What? Like that's, that's so, that's gross. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Number 10, the War of Unification. While technically pre-Empire, the Chin Wars of Unification are sick and nobody can stop me from talking about them. Prior to their campaign, the relatively small state of Chin had evolved to gain a surprising degree of prominence, becoming one of the seven major states in power at the time. Now this was due to the numerous battles centuries prior that I can't talk about this time, but I, I promise they were really cool. One of which was actually credited as basically being responsible for the unification of China, despite it having had occurred like 40 years prior. 
Just look up the Battle of Shangpeng. It was wild. In any case, the War of Unification was a result of this, running from uh, 230 to 221 BC. It saw Ying Zheng declaring war on the states of Han, Zhao, Wei, Yan, and Qi, conquering them in just about that order. This led to a complete unification of China, an effort which only took barely a decade to complete. Number 9. The Dazhejian Uprising Skipping ahead a bit into the future, following the spoilers, death of Qin Shi Huang, there were a bunch of uprisings. Also known as the Chen Sheng and Wu Guang Rebellion, named after its respective leaders, the uprising began when two officers were ordered to lead their soldiers to defend Yu Yang. Halted by flooding, they realized that, due to Qin laws, being late for their government job would result in their executions without respect for the excuse. So they did what anyone would do. Rile up the peasants and go for a good old revolution. And better than getting slaughtered for missing a shift, right? Well, they thought so. And managed to get around 900 peasants to back their cause. How they did this isn't completely confirmed, but there are two stories about how they might have gone about the process, and both are really weird. See, one story goes that Chen Sheng and Wu Guang wrote the words King Chen Sheng on some silk, and then fed that silk to a fish. When the fish was purchased and presumably cut open by soldiers, they saw the message and thought it was sick. Another story goes that they supposedly taught animals to say, Da Chu flourishes King Chen Shang, which likely would have had a similar effect on anyone who heard that from like a cow. So now, these might be slightly embellished, but they're also really funny, so come on. Either way, they got stopped by the chief, so it doesn't really matter. Number eight, getting owned zoned by a peasant. We're getting outside of the actual reign of the Qin again, but uh, I don't care. The Qin dynasty post-death of Qin Shi Huang was an absolute mess. Leaders were desperately trying to consolidate power, body their opposition, and avoid getting bodied in the process. The effective orchestrators of the chaos Li Xi and Zhao Gao, who we will get to, had a massive falling out which resulted in Li Xi's execution. Zhao Gao was trying to run everything, deposing the old emperor in favor of a new one, who then got rid of Zhao Gao. But the new emperor, Ji Ying, was a moron, and so eventually a real revolt uh, broke out in uh, 209. The rebels of Chu, led by uh, Lieutenant uh, Liu Bang and leader Zhang Yu, managed to defeat Ji Ying in in 207 BC. Of course, in traditional period fashion, Liu Bang betrayed Zhang Yu and founded the Han Dynasty, despite being a peasant. I have been in car accidents that have had less whiplash than the last, like, two years of the Qin Dynasty. Oh, and uh, Liu Bang was, like, a peasant, by the way. A, a, a peasant who became the ruler of China. Number seven, the Terracotta Warriors. Okay, so you probably know a little bit about this one. In 1974, a bunch a bunch of farmers in the Lin Tong County managed to dig up this exceptional find. Three pits containing statues of 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. Construction on the tomb began during Qin Shi Huang's reign. He had a thing about dying, but uh, we'll get into that later. And the soldiers were originally painted, though due to the climate and about roughly two millennia of time, it uh, kind of faded. There have been arguments that some of the paint could have been sourced from Greece, although the idea that the Greeks and the Qin Dynasty ever made content is hotly contested, so I'm not getting into that. But it can't really be stated in words how massive this project was. Every soldier was armed. Every single one constructed by hand, and the tomb itself is about 98 square kilometers, or you know, 38 square miles for the Yanks in the audience. Easily one of the single most impressive pieces of architecture known to man, it's just yet another impressive reminder of the exact scale and scope of the Qin Dynasty. Number 6. The Twelve Statues Alright, story time! So, when Qin Shi Huang defeated the six other states in his quest for dominance, he demanded that every single conquered state hand over all of their weapons to him. He then melted those weapons and reportedly had them cast into 12 massive metal statues and a couple of bells or something. Each were reported to weigh about a thousand don, or roughly 133,000 pounds. Now, where are these colossi now? Well, a few 
few centuries after the fall of Qin, Emperor Dong Zhuo reportedly had about nine of them melted down to make coins. However, because the statues were made out of a hodgepodge of different metals, and more importantly because Dong Zhuo is a moron, uh, the coins didn't weigh the same, which resulted in the mass devaluing of all copper cash. I really want to do a video on Lu Bu, and specifically how he offed Dong Zhuo. The guy, that guy was a creep. Anyways, uh, as for the other three statues, nobody really knows where they are, so maybe there's another discovery on a similar level to the Terracotta Warriors on the horizon. And last but not least, let's end Let's tie this whole thing together with survival. So how in the heck did we survive this thing? It was one foul hit after another. Bad weather, famine, plague, economic downturn, war, people being the worst. Well, a lot of it just had to play out on its own. The plague eventually died down, the planet started to slowly warm up, and along with those changes, the economy started to recover, though it would take over a century for it to actually be effective again. In the mid 7th century, Europeans began melting silver from lead ore, which led to the merchant class for the first time. This was a huge step. The Byzantines dedicated themselves to the preservation of history, and even though Justinian was the worst financially at the time, the critical reform he made regarding the legal system and those pesky construction projects set them on the right path for the future. So there you have it folks, though it was an insanely bleak period in history, we got out of it eventually. Slowly but surely, we just gotta keep going. Number 9. Famine So related to the last point, in a time in history where there's no industrial agricultural sector, greenhouses and those grow lights that you're totally not growing the devil's lettuce with in your basement. Yep, that's right, I know about it, mm -hmm. nice try, I know. Growing food can be difficult, weather, pests, disease, harvesting a full crop is both rewarding and difficult. Well, since the dust cloud had blocked out the sun for 18 months, that meant the crops were not reaching their full fruiting potential. This cloud of dust again most likely came from volcanic eruptions and is speculated to have even dropped the temperature a few degrees. God, that sounds awful. Number 8. The Plague Man, this is really shaping up to be the worst year ever. We thought 2020 was bad. Also in the year 536, there was a terrible plague, known as the Justinian Plague, or really it's the Black Plague, but it's the first round of it. As if having the sky filled with smoke and no food wasn't worse enough, people were dropping left, right, and center. Literally, they couldn't keep up with the body count, apparently reaching thousands within days. That's that's bad. You don't like that's not good. You don't want that. There were so many bodies that it began to stink up constantly. Constantinople. The bodies were thrown into the sea, but they kept resurfacing, which God, that's so gross. I oh, can't even gonna be sick. So Emperor Justinian ordered the bodies removed from the city, which oftentimes led to the body carriers themselves succumbing to the disease. Too bad they're years away from some Purell and a mask. You know, just some little something to sanitize the hands with, you know? Jeez. Number seven, winter. Canada. Winter snow. For about seven to eight months out of the year in this country, it is cold, snowy, and cold weather, right, Chris? Oh yeah. Mind you, we do get nice summers here, it's just a little bit of a trade-off. So when it snows here, even in May, it's not that much of a surprise. However, when it does snow in places like Texas, we tend to take notice. This was the case in 536 China and in places in Mesopotamia, where during the summer months, there were reports of snow, which is really bad, especially if you're trying to grow food. I mean, there's no snow shovels, no plows, and no timmies. Canadians, how would we even function without a double-double on a cold, miserable morning? All Canuck jokes aside, it was quite devastating to the regions and just adds more to what really must be the worst year ever. Number six. Time to get oot. I am many things. Canadian, moderately funny, and a second rate John Candy or Chris Farley. I love them both, but it depends where you're from. If you're Canadian, it's John Candy. If you're American, it's probably Chris Farley. What I'm not is, is a quitter. I'm a soldier, a fighter, a trooper, and I hustle my bustle, partner. I'm not shy to turn away from a challenge, and I strive to figure it out. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not afraid to throw in the towel. Sometimes you gotta know when to pull back, reassess, and most importantly, come back. If you, if you come back, you never really quit, did you? If you Come back, you're good. Take for an example some towns in central and eastern Sweden during 536 who abandoned their towns. No one is really sure why, but uh, these towns were abandoned, <laughs> obviously. Not that it's easy to run a town, because trust me, I play city builders, I would know, but it's speculated that already cool temperatures could have been made worse by the volcanic ash that covered the sky. Ooh, yeah, you wouldn't want cold temperatures getting worse back then. Mm -mm bad for you. Number five, hysteria. Okay, so what's the first thing people are gonna do when the skies turn to ash and crops perish and it's cold? 
Well, what will we do? Band together and fight through the elements as humans because we are stronger together? Ah, big prank! No, we panicked and had mass hysteria. And it was our fault and God was punishing us for our sins. Or at least one story from Egypt, that's how the story goes. Sure, I guess this is all bad luck and it would seem like divine intervention to people back then. Especially with the sky being so dark for so long. That's that does seem like something a god would do. And if you think we still don't do that, well, wind the clock back two years ago, my friends. Remember when toilet paper was running low? That, my friends, is textbook hysteria. But then again, you know, having a dark cloud in the sky is all right, but there'd be a lot of dark clouds in your pants, you know what I'm saying? You miss you got toilet paper, you know what I'm saying? Number four, more volcanoes. What's worse than having a volcano cause all these issues? More volcano eruptions, yeah, let's go! Yeah, again, no one is sure if there was a specific one that was causing all the issues, but evidence in Iceland suggests that there were at least two volcanic eruptions. There's other evidence that suggests it could have been all the way in El Salvador and even North America. A lot of folks just don't realize how catastrophic volcanoes can be, but if you ask somebody in Pompeii, they would tell you. These extra eruptions plunged the earth into what is sometimes called the tiny ice age as temperatures severely dropped. Well, a couple, a couple degrees can make a big difference. It sounds bad, but a couple degrees can. All I'm gonna say is that comedy comes in threes. I'm surprised there wasn't a third eruption. Why is the ground shaking? Number three, Romulus Fallus. 536, this awful, no good, very bad year, likely sealed the fate of the Roman Empire. For a while, she had been in decline, and her capital had already moved east. But like a lot of washed up sober music stars of the 80s, it was time for one more tour. One last hurrah to capture glory in a bottle. Well, go ahead and look at the map of Europe right now. I'll give you a second, go ahead, sure, look at it. You see that? Yeah, there's no Roman Empire, is there? No. That's because the year 536 was full of disease, war, and uprisings. Pesky uprisings. Ugh, those are the worst. How, how's, a, how's a dictator supposed to rule without those? Come on. In the year 541, an estimated 30% of the Byzantine Empire had perished from the plague. That's not good. You gotta have the population there. That's bad. Number two, Mosh Trouble. The Mosh were a civilization in what is now Peru. That's right, there were troubles back there too. It's not all just Europe. They were extremely dominant of that area, masters of irrigation and fishermen. They made their food stockpiles big, and they were a force to be reckoned with. Had a pretty decent economy too. Well, due to some weather changes in the area, the water temperature rose. Ooh, too much. The fish that the Mosh relied on for food and economy were now gone. And when you're a single industry empire and that industry goes away, well, well, it's gonna hurt. This led to massive starvation in the Mosh. Funny enough, all this climate change in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, I know we're jumping all over the place here, but it was good. The climate was okay. They saw more rainfall allowing for better crops, which allowed them to bring more camels. More camels means more soldiers. More soldiers means more conquering. It's crazy how it works like that. So I guess it just depends where you live. 